job to doing some of these uh, some pedestrian suspension bridges down in some of these remote areas. So this one was truly uh, different. So Del uh, Puente Engineering is going to tell us about their project here in Darien Province. Good morning. We are Del Puente Engineering, and we're part of Michigan Tech Senior International Design Program. I'm Jillian. I'm Corinne. I'm Carissa. I'm Tom. And I'm Wes. And our project was a bridge to the Comarca, the design of the Chukanaki River footbridge. As Del Puente Engineering, we created this mission statement to help guide us on our journey to Panama, along with helping with our design this fall. Over this presentation, we'll be telling you about some of our experiences that we had while in the community, while also giving you a little bit of background about the people that live there. And then we'll be going over some of our design requirements. We'll tell you about how we collected our data along with the result. And I'll be showing you our final design. Um, we'll show you our schedule, what the estimated costs end up being, and then we'll give you a quick summary and open the floor to any questions. So we started our trip in Panama City, which is shown up there at the Yellow Star. And then from there, we took the Inter-American Highway down this red highway to the Green Star in the Embra Munan Comarca. And a Comarca is a separate governing body of Panama. And this Comarca was completely separated from the rest of Panama by the Chukinaki River, which is the site of our project. So in Panama, to get out to the Comarca, we started with taking a six hour bus ride on a bus that's similar to a Greyhound. And then from there, it took us to the dirt road that is shown in the picture on your left. And then from there, the only way to get to the port is by either a taxi or a Chiba. And a Chiba is a covered pickup truck with benches in the back. And then from there, and you can see a city in that picture. And then from there, the only way to get onto the Comarca is by taking a dugout canoe, which is shown in this middle picture. And that was about the the community we stand in was Alto Playon. It is one of six communities in this comarca. It was founded in 1987 by the three brothers that are centered in the picture on your left. Um, they moved to this community with 16 other people because they needed more land for their farms. And it has since grown to 262 people, of which 117 are under the age of 15. Um, total in the comarca, there are about 2,000 people that could benefit from this bridge. The other picture, you see our first view of Alto Playon. You can see a typical house, which is an open air home with wood slabs and built up on stilts to protect from flooding and wild animals. Um, you can also see that they have thatched roofs or zinc corrugated roofs. Here you can see an umbrella lady doing laundry on your right. Um, the Chukinaki River is a very important resource for the umbrella. Um, as I said, they use it for laundry, they also use it for drinking water, for bathing, for defecation, and for trash disposal. They do have some rainwater catchment systems, but during the dry season, the, when it doesn't rain, um, they have to use the river to drink water, and they don't have any water purification or sanitation system besides that. The people are mainly subsistence farmers, although the women do some crafts with the materials from their roofs. Um, they weave plates and baskets like the ones in this picture. Also, with all the children, there is a school that goes up through ninth grade. However, if they want to continue their education, they have to go up to the nearest high school, which is outside of the Comarca and more expensive. So our team was actually fortunate enough to be there during their annual festival, which they had to celebrate the anniversary of their school. Uh, for this festival, they had hundreds and hundreds of people coming to their community uh, from various other communities throughout the Comarca, as well as uh, just the teen villages. And for this festival, they had a giant soccer tournament, and the winners are pictured here celebrating. And they also had a basketball tournament, but their version of basketball is a little bit different than ours. Uh, for their version, as you can see in this picture on the right, women would play barefoot and in skirts on the concrete. And as part, of the, as part of their festival, they also had a little beauty pageant at the school for the kids. And they had them all dress up in their traditional clothes, which was pretty cool to see. And then at night, they also brought in a Latino band that started playing music at 8 o'clock in the evening and played all through the night until 7 o'clock the next morning. So there's just people up all night dancing and partying. And the next morning, when we rolled out of bed, so why is there a need for a bridge at this location? Um, the only way to access the Comarcas during the rainy season is by 
the motorized dugout canoes, which we took. However, this is very expensive. To put it into perspective, gasoline costs about the same here as it does around these communities. However, if um, someone were to work on another person's farm, they would only make $10 a day. So this makes it very non-economic to leave the community, and this would be for reasons such as continuing their education into high school, um, medical emergencies, or um, some farmers have expressed the desire that if there were a way to transport their um, product to other markets, they would grow a surplus of food instead of just sustaining their families. The Chukinaki River is the longest river in Panama. It's about 134 miles uh, together with two other rivers in front of the Chukinaki watershed, which is over 4,000 square miles. While in Panama, we are not able to obtain adequate flow data in order to determine the 100-year flow line. <coughs> However, we talked to the community members, and the highest level they remembered it being was in 2010, which was when it reached the bottom of the pump house, which you'll see later. Um, later, we were able to find rainfall data, for example, this precipitation map, that verified that the highest flow over the past 30 years was during the 2010 flood in Panama. <coughs> So what are some of the main design challenges of our location? The first is that the soil consists primarily of clay, so not only is it prone to erosion, but it's also going to be difficult to get enough bearing capacity for our towers and anchor blocks. As you can see in this house, the foundation is actually being undercut by the river during high water, and it's not expected to make it through the current rainy season, so that's why we're concerned about erosion. Another challenge is that there is very large debris that floats down the river on a fairly regular basis, such as the trees shown here. So we will need to make sure that whatever our design is, is high enough out of the water to prevent any damage from such debris. So how we are planning on handling the slope stability and erosion issues is to use a paving system similar to that seen here, which is the pump house which is already located at the port. It draws water out of the Chukinaki River for a nearby uh, community for Metati on the non farm side of the river. A gabion is essentially a chain link enclosed rock base, and that um, this slope was in place during the 2010 flood when the water reached the foundation of this pump house and remained intact, so we feel like it is an adequate way to ensure that our slopes are also stable. The primary type of work while we did in Panama was surveying the proposed bridge location at the port. Uh, for the survey, we had to use all non-electronic equipment because there was no power out there. So it's a little bit of a learning curve to use this equipment, but we got pretty decent at it. Uh, these two pictures uh, were taken during our sur survey uh, from the Marca side of the river. In the picture on the left, we're looking at the forts. Uh, you can see it's nice and wide open. There's the pump house in the right of that picture. And the other picture is 180 degrees the other way. On um, this side of the river is dense jungle. Uh, we actually had to get our boat driver with his machete to pack down the jungle in some spots so we can see the survey. So the main objective of this project is to provide a permanent uh, way to cross the Chukunaki River. So some of the alternatives we considered were a uh, cast-in-place concrete vehicular bridge. However, when talking to community members about their uh, financial resources, this was deemed to not be an acceptable option. Another way to reduce costs was to design a bridge with an removable deck. So there would be permanent towers on each side of the river, and then as the water level rises, the deck could be and then once the water has receded, the deck will be put back in place. However, another community on the Chukunaki River near our community had a bridge similar to this, and they were not able to remove the deck in time, and it was still swept downstream during a high water area. So it was not something that our communities were interested in pursuing. A third option was to use essentially a barge system with guide cables to cross the river right at that location. However, this had the same problem with being swept um, away by high water or debris, um, so it was not considered, which leaves us with our final design option, which is a suspension bridge, which will allow the deck to be um, up 15 feet above the 100 year flood line. Once we decided to pursue a pedestrian suspension bridge, we then had to decide what loads to be applied during our design. So not only are we considering pedestrian traffic, there are also a few families in the Comarcas that own horses, so we will be considering an equestrian load to ensure the materials can easily be transported across the bridge. Um, we are also considering motorcycle loads because the border control in this area uses motorcycles and dirt bikes as their primary form of transportation, and they have outposts on both sides 
of the river, so we're assuming they're going to use this bridge. And then we also looked at lateral loading from the wind and size. So all this site survey was the result of all our survey work. Uh, there's 160 data points that went into it. And we used this map to get various design criteria for our bridge, such as the length of the span and where we're going to locate each of the foundations. Um, now we'll show you a few um, before and after pictures. Uh, we were able to obtain a 3D model from a Bridges to Prosperity site. Um, so here is a view looking upstream. Uh, you can see the existing pump house. Um, and this would be the after um, visual, I guess. Um, we were able to overlay it on the picture. Um, you can see some of the different components. Um, again, it's very high above the current water level. Um, that's because this river floods. Um, the level fluctuates very much, so that allows enough for that um, 15 feet of freeboard under the high level mark um, to reduce from objects hitting it. Here's another view uh, standing at the port. Um, you can see some more components that we'll be talking about. Um, steel towers, the foundations, as well as some of the different cable systems. Then here is a final view um, looking as you're walking onto the bridge from the port side. Um, you can see some more detail um, as far as the planks, um, the support beams, and some other connections that we'll be discussing. So here is a plan view of our suspension bridge um, overlaid on our site survey data. Um, the, you can see some of the various components um, the tower footings are set back far enough from the river um, to allow for that flooding. Um, the other main consideration was to allow for access to the existing pump house. Um, there's a, a road leading up to it, so they would need to go um, around our suspension bridge um, to allow access for maintenance. Here is a profile view of our suspension bridge. Um, we went with a typical suspension bridge design. Um, the main cables, um, as shown, there'd be two inch and a half steel cables on each side, um, and then those would be suspended from tower to tower, um, which are 50 feet tall. Um, the overall clear span is 275 feet, so this resulted in a fairly large bridge. Um, the main cables are then tied into the anchor blocks, which we'll be discussing later. Um, so the load is transferred from the decking. Um, to the suspender cables, which are the vertical cables shown, <coughs> and then that load is transferred into the main cables, and then over the towers, um, then vertical loads through the towers, and then the anchor blocks provide um, the resistance for the main cables. Here are uh, the view of our steel towers. Um, like I said, they're 50 feet tall. Um, they're composed of 10 foot um, box truss sections. So they're two foot by two foot sections. Um, they would be shop fabricated sections of um, steel angle iron and solid round bars. Um, those would all be shop welded and then put together in the field using steel plates and um, bolts. Um, you can also see in the elevation view the cross bracing. Um, this provides lateral support from um, wind on the tower itself as well as wind on the cables throughout the span. The view on the top is um, the fabricated saddle that sits on top of the towers. Um, this allows for the main cables to slide freely over top. Um, this results in the loads being primarily vertical um, down through the tower, um, which results in uh, reduced member sizes. Um, on the top, there's a um, three inch um, bent pipe section. Um, and then again, this allows the um, cables to slide freely. And then on the bottom detail is a typical connection. Um, you can see the cross bracing is also bolted in, as well as um, the plates bolted together. So to support the loads from the towers, we will need to use a granular backfill to provide that adequate bearing capacity because of the clay on the site. So this is a detail of the gaming system we're planning to use for the slope protection, as well as showing the backfill that will be necessary for the bridge. Um, each unit of the gaming system is going to be a 5 foot <coughs> cube, enclosing 4 to 12 inch rock. Um, you can also see the approach to the bridge. We went with a gravel ramp as our um, approach method, rather than like stairs or something like that, because of those horses and motorcycles that are going to be accessing the bridge. <coughs> and here you can see some of our decking details. The top photo is a section view of our bridge. And our bridge is made out of wood decking and the wood is locally found in the area. And then it is supported about every three feet by double angles, which is shown in the profile in the bottom. 
And then this is an assembly of the walkway design. You can see the suspender cables coming down and then they will connect into the bracing of the double angles and there will be a steel plate that will be shot bolted onto there that an eye bolt will go through and that is where you'll be able to tension the suspender cables. And then you can also see there that we have a chain link fence and that will be about four feet up and that will act as a railing for the pedestrian. Here you can see the plan and section view of a typical anchor block. They are 18 by 26 by 8 feet, um, a massive reinforced concrete. And the anchorage hook is embedded into the anchor block, which is then connected to a turnbuckle, which you can see a detail of that. And then on the other end of the turnbuckle, it's attached to one of the main cables. Which is, and then the turnbuckle will be tightened down to the appropriate tension for the bridge. These anchor blocks were designed to sit on top of the soil because the location is often flooded and since it's mainly clay, we cannot count on adequate pressure. Um, they're both designed to sit on top and it resists bearing, sliding, and overturning failures. So like the anchor blocks, the foundation that the towers sit on are also basically a giant cube of concrete. The face that sits on the granular fill is 20 feet by 12 feet and it is 6 feet high. Uh, it's enclosed in a grid of rebar. Uh, the foundations mainly just handle the compressive force from the towers because, like Wes said, it's all vertical forces. Um, you can also see a detail of the anchorage hooks that are embedded in the concrete to transfer the load from the cables to the concrete. And these are basically just a one square inch steel rod. So once we finished our final design, we then estimated the total cost of our project. We used Panamanian suppliers for the cost of materials as well as equipment and labor costs. We then used our scenes as a reference for production rates for each item. And our final cost of the bridge came out to $418,000, which we acknowledge is a very large sum for these communities. However, we will be discussing funding in a further slide. Um, one of the main uh, cost reductions that we are hoping to see on this project is there are many companies associated with the Panama Canal who will donate their used uh, overhead crane cables to projects similar to these. So if we can get the main cables donated, that will take out the $88,000 in the final cost. <coughs> After we finished our cost estimate, we then scheduled the project. And similar to the previous uh, team, we are going to have to use two dry seasons to complete the work because we can only work from roughly mid-December into the beginning of May. So tasks such as permitting and material procurement can occur during a rainy season. And then during the first dry season, we will be able to construct the gaming system with the backfill and for the tower footings. We will then let the bridge sit at this state for the next rainy season and then build the towers themselves, uh, span the cables, and, and place the decking. We acknowledge that constructability is definitely going to be one of the most difficult parts of this design due to the remote location. However, we are planning on using a guide for the towers during construction and we are also looking into a lifting system so we can use minimal equipment on site. As Carissa mentioned earlier, if for this bridge to become a reality for the communities of the Comarca, some type of funding will need to be found. And this funding, can come from Bridges to Prosperity or Engineers Without Borders of Panama or some other similar governmental organization. So we started our trip in Alto Playon where we met with community members to find their needs for a bridge. Then we settled on, we, didn't, we decided to build a suspension bridge for this community, to design a suspension bridge for this community with a complete construction duration of six months and an estimated cost of 400 dollars we would like to acknowledge our international senior design advisors, Dr. Watkins and Professor Dewar. And then we'd also like to thank our Peace Corps volunteers, Asha Kennedy and Amber Naylor, along with Clint Donnelly, who's the president of Engineers Without Borders Panama, and Larry Galpin of CH2. Thank you for your time. And we'll open the floor to any questions. Okay. Um, so we're
um, roughly is 10 <coughs> feet of header. Um, so we figured, and from other designs, that was kind of similar. And it, it does, you know, look low, but enable to, you know, to reduce the size of those members is important to get that cross bracing as much as possible. You've got a lot of exposed steel. How are you going to protect it from corrosion? Um, yeah, so we um, expect that it would have to be um, painted. Um, I guess you can use galvanized bolts. Um, but yeah, the, that's kind of a big concern with steel is the like, corrosion and then the maintenance um, and upkeep on that. So I didn't see um, painting in your cost um, That's in the cost of the towers itself. So in that 33000 